I invite you to go ahead and grab your Bibles, pull open your Bible, whether you're accessing God's Word on your phone or a tablet, or if you've got a real physical Bible. And I want to continue just to encourage you. There's something, I, I, I know it sounds old school, but a physical Bible is a good way to access God's Word because there's no Facebook notifications on here. Amen, somebody. There's no email notifications on here. There's, n- or whatever other kind of craziness might come through that demon you call a phone. Hey, welcome to Venice Church. Uh, my name is Matt. Uh, we're super glad that you're here. Today is going to be a really special day. Before we finish our time together today, we're going to do what we call child dedication. It's a special time in the life of our church where uh, we, we don't do infant baptism here because we think baptism is something that comes on the other side of a personal profession of faith. When somebody confesses their belief in Jesus and trust in him, that that's a public display of that decision that they make. Y'all with me say Amen. Um, But what we do is child dedication, and it's a time where parents, moms, dads, families come up onto this platform and just make a public declaration of their intention to raise a child to know Jesus, that they understand that the child they've been entrusted with is a gift from God to steward well, and that that child needs an example in that home of what it means to love, know, and serve Jesus. And what parents do through child dedication is dedicate that child to the Lord and make a commitment to God and to people that they're going to do their best with the help of the Holy Spirit to model Jesus before that child in a way that helps that child to grow up and know Christ and love and serve him one day so that we raise another generation on fire for Jesus Christ. So we'll do that at the end of our time together, and it'll be really special. But right now, again, I invite you to open your your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. Because today we begin our journey towards Easter, which is just a few weeks away. And that seems crazy that we're getting close. And and there, there, maybe I'm biased, I probably am, but there is nothing like celebrating Easter at Vintage Church. It is always an amazing time together on that weekend. And it's quickly coming. And as we prepare our hearts to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, which in my not my opinion, I deeply believe that the, resurre- the, the, the life, death, crucifixion, resurrection of Jesus, the most significant events in all of human history. The resurrection of Jesus is the most significant event in all of human history. It changed everything. That Jesus opens the gateway for us to experience all the promises of God that we've been talking about the last eight weeks, that in him and through only him do we get access to God. We've been looking at this whole idea of promises over the last eight weeks, and I'm reminded in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, it's going to be on the screen. I won't read it word for word, but it basically says this, that in him we get access to the promises. That for every one of God's promises is yes in him, in Christ Jesus. Therefore, through him, Jesus, we also say amen to the glory of God. That Jesus is the pathway to the promises of God. That through him, through his atonement, through his death, through his resurrection, through his life, through his message and miracles, we're shown the way. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. And he's also the example that we're supposed to emulate, right? That we're not called to be like Moses and we're not called to be like David, as as great a men as they are. That we're called, Jesus is, is God's example of what humanity was supposed to look like. And the reason why our church exists to inspire people to live in love like Jesus is because that's the mission that Jesus gave his disciples. Before he left this earth, he looked at them and he basically said this, go make disciples because you've seen in me everything that the Father desires. So go share what you've heard because God... God doesn't do anything in and through you that's just for you. It's supposed to be passed on to other people. That God is not just limited to you. And so Jesus is that example for us. And if he is our example, and if we're going to celebrate his resurrection, we need to look at his life. Because look at me, we need to make sure that the the target Jesus we're aiming for is the one of scripture, not the one of culture. (laughs) Because I often hear people throw the name of Jesus around and say, well, Jesus wouldn't or Jesus would. I'm like, I don't know what Jesus you're talking about, but it's not the one represented in the Bible. And the only way we know the true Jesus is through studying the one that exists on the pages of Scripture that existed in real humanity 2,000 years ago. And And luckily for us, we don't have to take a guess at what Jesus was like because God gave us four narratives about his life, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. What we know was the Gospels, 
The first four books in what you know is your New Testament, when you open up your Bible and start reading there after Malachi, before you get to Revelation and all the letters of Paul, there's these four Gospels. And each one is very intentionally written. Did you know that? Did you know that there was a lot of writings about Jesus in his day? Because look at me. You, you, there might be some people that want to debate whether or not Jesus was who he says he was. But you cannot argue that he was real. You cannot argue that this man that, that we believe to be the only son of God who defeated death and did physically raise from the dead and ascended to the Father, who is fully God, fully man, the only atonement that we can get for sins. He existed because there were things written about him even outside of Scripture, written by historians that were contemporaries of Jesus' day. People like a man named Josephus, who maybe you've never heard of, who wasn't a gospel writer or a writer of Scripture, but wrote historical accounts of the things that occurred during Jesus' day. He's referred to many times. There's many historical documents, but by God's provision, we deeply believe that the four gospels that we have give us the picture of Jesus that God wanted us to have. And each one of the gospel writers comes with a little bit of different angle because each writer had a different target audience in mind that they were trying to convince about Jesus. Now listen, I'll be the first to tell you, every gospel writer had an agenda. Just because they had an agenda doesn't mean it's not accurate. They had an agenda. Every gospel writer wrote with the hopes that whoever would read it would believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And they had different target audiences and minds and different ways of approaching telling Jesus' story based on who they were trying to get to read it, to understand it, and to believe in Jesus. As you read through the Gospel of Matthew, you'll notice that Matthew very intentionally targets people like him, people who were Jewish. And he includes so many things to get people who were Jewish, who grew up in this tradition to see that what was started in the Old Testament, all the things that were pointing to the future, that Jesus fulfilled it, that in him was the fulfillment of all the things that they had hoped for and learned about when they were little kids, when they would sit at the feet of the rabbi and read the Torah and those first five books of the Bible and read of the prophets and listen to Isaiah and Jeremiah and all these other men and women who had gone before them. Matthew writes hoping that so many of his people who had missed it would begin to get it. Y'all with me say amen. And Mark's gospel is very much leans into the, the power of miracle. And so miracles all throughout John Mark's gospel who had been probably discipled by Peter and had heard about all these things about Jesus. And John, John is one we walked through a few summers ago. And to to me, maybe up until now, I've always kind of leaned towards John being my favorite because it was the last one written. And it was written by the, the apostle John, the disciple John, who had a real unique relationship with Jesus. We're going to learn this as we, as we walk through the gospel that we're about to lean into, but there were a lot of people that followed Jesus during his ministry. Come on. I mean, because he did things like, like, like he fed people, you feed people, they follow you. Come on, amen. But he, when John writes his gospel, he's old man, and he's the last one to write. And I think he probably thinks there's some stories that didn't get told. And I got to see some stories because, see, as I said, Jesus had all these followers, and and Luke is going to tell us later that there's a night where Jesus goes up on a mountain, he prays all night long. He prays all night long. Then he comes down off the mountain that next morning, and he goes among this group of people that have been following him, and he picks 12. And see, maybe maybe didn't know that. There there weren't just 12 disciples. There were a lot of disciples, but there were 12 specific disciples that God, led by the Father, chose to more intentionally invest in to prepare them to be leaders in his movement that would follow. And among that 12, there were three, two brothers, James and John and Peter, they got to experience things that not all the other 12 even got to experience. Like when Jesus went up on the Mount of Transfiguration and was transfigured before them and Elijah and Moses show up and God kind of puts this stamp on Jesus. The only three people that with Jesus were there were Peter, James, and John, and they got to see some really cool stuff. But the one I want us to lean into as we lean into the life of Jesus is we're going to look at the life of Jesus through the lens of the Gospel of Luke. Because Luke is very unique. Luke wasn't one of the original 12. Luke is is this Greek physician 
that comes to faith after Jesus' life, after his death, after his resurrection, after his ascension. And, and Luke, when he found Christ, it changed his life. And, and he began to be a champion for the message of the gospel. And he wanted to share it with other people. And so he wrote a, a two-volume work. I don't know if you know this, that, that Luke, the gospel of Luke, was written by this Dr. Luke. He also wrote the book of Acts. And word for word, he actually wrote more of the New Testament than any other writer. I know all of us assume that Paul wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else because there's just so many more books by Paul because he wrote all these different letters to all these different churches. But word for word, Luke wrote more of the New Testament than any other writer because he wrote the entirety of the Gospel of Luke and the entirety of the book of Acts. And this this two-volume snapshot into the life of Jesus and the events that follow. And Luke is very intentional to say, I want to show these events in a really particular powerful order in the hopes that you will become certain that what has happened among us is really of God. That's the way he opens it. Look at Luke chapter 1. Let's just read verses 1 through 4. Luke chapter 1. Starting with verse one, it says, many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us. Just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. Verse three, so it also seemed good to me since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. That right out of the gate, Luke gives us insight into why he's writing and to whom he's writing. That there's this man named Theophilus. It says, most honorable. It almost been like your excellency, Theophilus. And now we don't know a lot about Theophilus. He has a cool name. You know his name means? Lover of God. It's pretty cool. He says, what I've done is I've sought to investigate all these things that have happened. And again, Luke was a man of science. How do we know he was a physician? Flip over to Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, right here. Paul is writing this letter to the Colossians, and he says, Luke, the dearly loved physician, Dr. Luke, PhD, the dearly loved physician, and Demas send you greetings. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, it would say that, that Luke had been so loyal to Paul that even when other people were abandoning him, Luke stuck around. That Luke was, was this Greek physician. He didn't, he didn't grow up in the Jewish tradition. And you actually see this moment in, in, in the book of Acts. It's right around Acts 16, I think it's verse 11, where you see Luke as he's writing, even, even change from talking about they to talking about we. In other words, from Acts 16, 11 on, it seems as if Luke is present for all the events that are unfolding as Paul goes through his, his second and preceding missionary journeys. That many believe that somewhere in that first missionary journey in one of these towns or one of these areas, Paul had led Dr. Luke to Jesus and it brought him to Christ. And even though he didn't grow up in the Jewish tradition and grow up with all the understanding of the prophets and the law and the Torah and all that, that through the message of Paul, Luke had this revelation that this man, Jesus, who lived among us, who he had probably heard about and wondered about, all of a sudden decided he is the one and Luke gave his life fully to him. And he says, I've decided that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek to put down an account of these things as well. And he says, there's a lot of people that have tried this. But Luke was a man of science. So I can imagine, and it's just a reminder, faith and, and logic are, are not opposing to each other. Church, faith and science are not opposing. God is the author of all science. He created the order that our world exists in. <laughs> And I can see him now, he, he goes and he interviews like an investigative journalist, except a good one. And asking these questions of people that saw Jesus, walked with Jesus, 
Was he, does, he, does he find out, hey, yeah, I think that guy was there the day that Jesus fed the 5,000. And he goes, he says, hey, tell me about your experience. Tell me about your story. And he begins to investigate all these events that he heard about Jesus. And based on all that research, he puts pen to paper and writes the story of Jesus' life. And Luke, like all the other gospel writers, is very intentional with the things that he tells because he has an audience too. And, and you're going to see that, that he is very intentionally trying to make it clear, look at me, that this Jesus he's writing about came to save everybody. Because I can guess that there was a moment in his life when he felt like the outsider. As he traveled with Paul, and he was around Paul, this this. this man trained as a Pharisee who studied under Gamaliel, the most, one of the wisest rabbis of his day, and had heard about all this true Jewish tradition. He didn't grow up like that. It's kind of like there's some people in this room, like you wonder if you fit in because you didn't grow up in the church and you didn't spend your life in Sunday school and you're coming to this and you're just trying to figure it out, but you don't have all the history that the people sitting around you. And sometimes you wonder, do you fit in? Yes, you do, because Jesus is calling you to salvation in him just like he is everybody else. Doesn't matter if you grew up in church, doesn't matter if you've never been in church your life. Doesn't matter if you've been exposed to the Bible your whole life, or maybe today the first time you saw the Word of God was on that screen. Jesus died for you, and he wants you to see him for who he is, and he's calling you to salvation. He wants you to see your sin, repent of that sin, and see him as the resolution for it so that you could be made right with God. That's the gospel. Amen. Let's not wait till Easter. Let me get fired up here on Sunday, a few weeks before. What was I saying? So Luke puts pen to paper, and again, he gives us his goal. He says, I'm writing this to you, and it's almost like he can tell Theophilus is starting to doubt. Go back and let's look at it one more time. Look at verse 4, chapter 1, verse 4, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. He says, Theophilus, I want you to know that what you've heard about Jesus, the faith that you've put in Jesus, I, I want you to know, like, hold to it. Hold to it. And maybe that's what somebody in the room needs to hear. You're wondering, you're living in a culture that's trying to strip away your faith. They try, try to tell you this pluralistic, universalist type mentality. No, hold to your faith that Jesus is the way. He's calling you to himself. He's calling you to himself. And so, Luke is trying to paint this picture rooted in the real events that unfolded in Jesus' life. And so he starts where, somewhat similar to where Matthew starts. You know, Matthew and Luke are the only two that give us the Christmas narrative to tell us the story about Mary and Joseph and Gabriel. And we know all that in chapter two, is, in chapter one and two, as he, as he talks about the angel visiting Mary and conceiving a child. And at the same time, there's Zachariah and Elizabeth, Mary's relatives, who are expecting a child, and they both become pregnant. Zachariah and Elizabeth are about to give birth to John the Baptist, this one that was prophesied who had paved the way for Jesus, the one that would go before him, calling people to repentance to prepare the way for the moment that Jesus would step onto the scene. And then Luke gives us a story that, that, the, uh, that none of the others do, this moment when after Jesus is born and they bring him into the temple to do what was ceremonially necessary in their culture, and there's this priest there named Simeon who has an old man and felt like the Lord had spoke to his spirit and say, before you die, you're going to see the Messiah. And when he steps into the temple, Mary doesn't go in and say, hey, y'all, I got the Messiah. She didn't do like the Lion King thing, like, here he is. No, she walks in and the spirit moves Simeon. and he realizes there's something different about that kid. There's something different about that child. And I want you to look what he says. Look at verse, the latter part of verse 27 in Luke chapter 2. It says, when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to perform what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms and praised God and said, now, master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. Do you see that? He's even saying for both. 
Like, I want you to pay attention to this as we walk through this gospel. Uh, yeah, a light to the Gentiles and for Israel. It is this Messiah, it may have come through the nation of Israel. It might have come through Abraham, but it was intended for everybody. He says, a light, a revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. Verse 33, his father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed. And a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts might be revealed. And then... For the next three decades nearly, Jesus gets tucked away in this little bitty town called Nazareth. And Luke records one story that makes every parent feel better in the room the moment that Mary and Joseph lost Jesus. There's this story where annually they would go back to Jerusalem to observe the celebrations and the festivals, and they go to Jerusalem for this one, and then they go back, and a whole day goes by, and somebody's like, where's Jesus? I'm like, wait, what? He's not with us? Makes you feel better about the time you lost that kid in Walmart, don't it? (laughs) For three days, (laughs) they weren't able to find Jesus, and then they go back in the temple, and Jesus, a 12-year-old kid, is holding court in a synagogue. And he says, where'd you think I'd be? I'd be, I'm in my father's house. And the rabbis who had been studying the scriptures for decades were blown away by this little boy, this 12-year-old kid's knowledge of the word. Why? Because this was no ordinary boy. This was no ordinary boy. This is the only begotten son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity. God incarnate, Emmanuel. And then for years and years, Jesus is tucked away. He hides out in Nazareth growing up. Mary and Joseph have other kids. That's right, Jesus had younger siblings that Mary and Joseph had biological kids of their own. You thought your brother cast a big shadow. I always think about, you know, like Mary's, Mary and Joseph's other kids were in the room, like, Jesus did it. And they're like, no, he didn't. <laughs> no, he didn't. You could never play that card as yeah, Jesus' little sister, you know. Oh, it was Jesus. No, it wasn't. (laughs) And then as he gets to about 30 years old, he begins to step on the scene. And as he comes on the scene, John the Baptist is doing what God ordained for him to do. He's going around preaching, saying the kingdom of God is near. Repent and be baptized. He's calling people to see the weight of their sin, to see the impact of it of the connection it has on their relationship and communion with God. He's saying, come, repent, and get baptized. And then Jesus comes onto the scene. And look what it says in Luke chapter 3, verses 3 through 6. It says, he went into the vicinity of the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This is John the Baptist. Verse 4, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight, the rough way smooth, and everyone, somebody say everyone, everyone will see the salvation of God. And Jesus comes and he's baptized and says, Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove, and a voice from the heaven cries out this this word of affirmation over Jesus, where the Father audibly speaks there in front of everyone about Jesus, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And this begins his ministry. If you keep reading, he goes into the wilderness, and he's tempted by the enemy for 40 days. And God gives us an example through Jesus of the toolkit he's given us between his presence and his word that we can can battle back against Satan when he brings temptation, that when he comes at us, we can go back at him and the power of God and with the sword of his word. Because every time he comes, he says this, and Jesus says, well, the word of God says this. And he, he, he shows us that we can walk in victory because we have all the tools necessary to overcome the enemy's attacks, that you don't have to keep falling victim to his schemes. You can live victoriously in the power of God and through the truth of his word. That was good preaching. You can. You can be victorious. 
And by the time you get to Luke chapter 4, Jesus returns back to his hometown as he's stepping out to his ministry. And it says this in chapter 4, verse 16. It says, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began by saying to them, today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. This is a scene that we can so easily skip over and start moving into all the miracles and all the other things of Jesus' life and start there. But this is a moment that can't go unnoticed because right here, Jesus is setting the tone for who he is and what he came to do and for whom he came to save. That apparently this was a regular practice for Jesus. He goes back to his hometown, he steps into the synagogue and he asked for a scroll of Isaiah. It wouldn't have been a book like we think of like pages like this. It would have been a scroll. And he asks for Isaiah and he rolls it down. And he finds Isaiah 61 and he reads it. And then he sits down. And I just, I, I just didn't see this long, awkward pause. And everybody, and he waits for every eye to get fixated on him. And he says, what I've just read is now being fulfilled in me. It reminds me of that moment that we talked about recently on our podcast. In John chapter five, John chapter four, somewhere in there, this moment when he's with the woman at the well and she's like, don't worry, someday when the Messiah comes, he's going to explain all this confusing stuff to us. He's going to explain about where we're supposed to worship and when we're supposed to worship. When the Messiah gets here, he's going to explain it all. And you remember what Jesus says to her? I am he. He's saying, it's me. I'm here. I am fulfilling everything that you've been waiting for. I've come to usher in. Isaiah was talking about me. I'm here. You're my hometown. You're my people. You're where I grew up. You're the people I love. I want you to know as much as I want anybody to know that the Savior of the world is sitting in front of you and I don't want you to miss it. And you notice what's interesting. If you've ever read Isaiah 61, he stops in what we would consider mid-verse. He says the Spirit, if you go to Isaiah 61, go to Isaiah 61. Because it says this, this this is the passage that Jesus was quoting. It says, the spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom for the prisoners. And this is where Jesus stopped, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But if you continue reading, it says this next. It says, and the day of God's vengeance. See, Jesus stopped because the next verse would speak to when he would return again, not what he was there to do right then. That Jesus will come back and this will be part of his mission, that he will bring judgment and vengeance and wrath. He said, but for now, I'm here to offer you something that will save you from that. Right now, what I'm here to do is offer you salvation that yes, the next line in that prophet says God's vengeance. And what I'm here to do is save you from it. I'm here to redeem you, to make you whole, to set you free. And he said, I've come to the poor. And when he says the poor, it's not talking necessarily about financially busted. He's talking about just bankrupt. I'm here for the poor, the people who feel broken and outcast and unworthy and unwanted. I'm here to save the people who think they can't be saved. They don't deserve to be saved. They don't need to be saved. I'm ushering in something that's going to call people into the mercy and grace of God that will save you from the vengeance that's promised later. You can have salvation and freedom right 
this minute if you'll just see me for who I am. That's what he was calling them to. And it says their immediate reaction is this, they were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Yet some of them said, ain't that Joseph's boy? They're sitting in the presence of the Messiah. They're sitting in front of the only one that has what they really need. And they're gonna miss it. They're gonna miss it. If you keep reading, he goes on to kind of say, to, to challenge them for missing it. Like, you're, you're not getting it. Yeah, you're, you're letting the tangible, physical things of the past keep you from seeing what's right in front of you in the present. And you're going to miss it. I don't want you to miss it. The next several weeks, we're going to walk toward Easter and we're going to celebrate his resurrection and we're going to celebrate the blood he shed on the cross and we're going to celebrate all the significance of this amazing, wonderful Messiah that we call Jesus. And it's so easy for you to miss it. These were people that had, had sat under all the things that you should sit under and be able to see Jesus for who he is. He looked and he read the scroll and he, they knew the prophets and they knew the Torah and they knew all these things. That you can be exposed to all the right things and still not experience Jesus for who he is. You can grow up in church. You can read your Bible. You can sit in this room. And you can walk toward Easter and once again be about the baskets and the dress and the deviled eggs and the ham at grandma's house and all these other things and miss it. And so today what I want to do is start the series. I want to, I want to put him right in front of you. And I want you to choose him. The people that were in his own hometown that watched these things unfold with their own eyes missed it. But Luke years later would hear these stories and come from the exact opposite background of all of them and somehow he got it that this Jesus that we're going to learn about through the lens of the gospel of Luke over the next few weeks look at me he died so you could have life he came for you he dove out of heaven for you for you who grew up in church, for you that hate church, even while you're sitting in here right now, because you came just because your nephew's getting dedicated and they drug you here. He came for you. When Jesus says, I've come to set captives free, to release addicts, to give joy to the depressed, to make whole the broken, to give peace to the anxious. That's why he came. He's calling you by name into relationship with him today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day for you to release your stubbornness, confess your sins, and trust God to save your soul and change your life. Would you stand up on your feet with me? Those families that are here to dedicate your children to the Lord, you can go ahead and head out. Go check your kids out if they're in there or if you have your kid in the room, just go ahead. The, some of our volunteers and staff will meet you at the kids check-in station to give you some instructions. And we're gonna dedicate some kids in a little bit. Before that, we're gonna sing. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? You. If Jesus is calling you today into relationship with him, listen to me, you don't need to pray any specific prayer. You don't have to regurgitate anything I give you. What you have to do is decide in your heart and in your mind and confess with your mouth that you need him. To acknowledge that you haven't just made mistakes, you've sinned and it's separated you from God and there's nothing you can do to fix it. But the good news is you don't have to fix it because he fixed it for you. 
that this Jesus that was sitting among his own people pointing to the reality of who he uh, is is the same Jesus in this room pointing to that same reality calling you to lay down your life and put yours into his and trust him for that salvation. So God, I pray that as we worship, as we lift up this song to you, God, that you would speak to our hearts, you would challenge us, you would call us into relationship with you. And if there's anybody in here that does not know you, do not let them leave this place without finding you right here in this moment, surrendering their heart to you, putting their trust in you as their savior and following you as their Lord from this day forward. Meet with us, God, in Jesus' name.